Coming up on Market to Market. The die is cast, what a Clinton presidency would mean to rural America. Adequate rain and good crop conditions feed market bears. And rural butchers work to stay a cut above the rest. Those stories and market analysis with Angie Setzer, next. Funding for Market to Market is provided by Grinnell Mutual. You think differently about a customer when you stand in the middle of his dreams. We work to make sure you get covered right. Grinnell Mutual, a policy of working together. Information on finding an agent near you is available at GrinnellMutual.com. This is the Friday, July 29 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Mike Pearson. While Brexit may have thrown world markets for a loop, U.S. consumers took it all in stride. Some bought a new place to live, while others decided against that new luxury jet. According to the conference board, consumer confidence fell back a scant one-tenth of one percent in June, as Americans remained cautiously optimistic about the future. Commerce Department data revealed sales of new homes rose three and a half percent in June, the fastest pace in eight years. Orders for durable goods tumbled 4% last month, the largest amount in two years. The drop was attributed to fewer aircraft purchases. When orders for big silver birds are taken out, durable goods were off half a percent. And the Fed's June meeting notes revealed the benchmark for a bump up in interest rates remains a 2% inflation rate. Janet Yellen, the first of her gender to head up the FOMC, is only one of a long line of females to claim the chair of any board. Women have always served an influential role in rural America, including CEO. However, the Democrats are the first major U.S. party to select a woman to compete for the top of the federal org chart. Peter Tubbs reports on what a Clinton presidency might mean for rural America. A familiar political face sits atop the Democratic ticket in 2016. And so, my friends, it is with humility, determination, and boundless confidence in America's promise that I accept your nomination for President of the United States. Hillary Rodham Clinton, former First Lady, New York Senator, and United States Secretary of State for the Obama administration, accepted the nomination for president at the Democratic National Convention in Philadelphia this week. Clinton's long record of both advocacy and voting provides much to consider for voters in farm states. The candidate has pledged to introduce immigration reform in her first 100 days in office. As senator, Clinton co-sponsored legislation to streamline and expand the H-2A agricultural visa program. The reform includes a pathway to citizenship for immigrants who have entered the country illegally. The former Secretary of State in the Obama administration opposes the Trans-Pacific Partnership on competitiveness grounds, fearing too many American jobs would migrate to lower-wage economies. Clinton would also broaden farm support benefits beyond traditional commodity crops and encourage business capital investment in rural communities. Clinton has staked out positions on several other agribusiness issues. The candidate favors the use of GMO seeds, particularly as a tool for international development, supports the Renewable Fuel Standard, or RFS, and plans to increase federal support of renewable energy with an emphasis on solar power. If you believe that we should say no to unfair trade deals, that we should stand up to China, that we should support our steel workers and auto workers and homegrown manufacturers, then join us. Clinton will face businessman, celebrity, and Republican nominee Donald Trump in the November 8th presidential election. From Market to Market, I'm Peter Tubbs. There was a time when a trip to the local meat locker was part of a weekly routine. The butcher often knew every customer by name and could offer help with a selection or two. The implementation of centralized meat cutting reduced the necessity for multiple stops on marketing day. However, as producer Colleen Bradford-Krantz discovered, 
the local locker has never been completely cut out of the picture. For decades, small butcher shops and meat lockers were a staple of American life. These mom and pop establishments began disappearing, however, as more families began to buy their meat at one-stop grocery stores. We've seen a fair amount of them disappear. Uh, they're older facilities, and when the current owners retire or move on through lack of interest in doing the work and are the building being old and maybe not up to date with its, you know, its, its equipment and standards that the government like to see in a building, they close down. But that downward trend may be slowing or even reversing. In May, Midwest grocery chain Fairway Stores opened a brand new, old concept meat shop in Omaha. The store, considerably smaller than its typical groceries, aims to capitalize on both the company's reputation for quality meat and nostalgia for old butcher shops. I hope that the customer comes in this Fairway Meat Market and has an experience of, once again, the old style meat markets from back in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, the way old Fairways were from the standpoint of uh, when they would see their butcher at the meat block, etc. But uh, we've taken that, we've kept that feeling, and we've modernized it. The Omaha Fairway Meat Market, the company's first, has a counter that is 16 feet longer than those in its typical store. It also features fresh seafood and grass-fed beef. And while larger metro areas such as New York, Chicago, and Los Angeles have new shops where the meat cutters like to call themselves artisanal butchers, there are others scattered throughout the nation where that kind of work never went out of style even if those butchers don't apply the same trending lingo to what they do. I'm not, hey Mike, you can edit all this, right? Yeah. yeah. What's the artisan butcher? You haven't heard anyone use that term? I, think, I like to Google that. <laughs> Although Chris Kramer, not related to Fairway's CEO, would never consider labeling himself this way, he is as much an artisan a marketing term that hints at a craftsman cutting by hand, as a butcher gets. Kramer is a fourth generation butcher who has run his own shop in Elmwood, Nebraska since 1981. His great grandfather was a butcher in Denmark. His grandfather, who owned a horse slaughter plant in Papillion, Nebraska, told stories of how some ate horse meat, normally used in dog food, during the lean years of World War II. Kramer's late father ran several butcher shops in his lifetime, both in Kansas and in Nebraska. In the late 1920s, the first meat lockers were opened in the U.S., and farmers or others rented frozen food storage to preserve the meat they had butchered. From, from the early days, settlers, so to speak, they did their butchering, obviously, on the farm. Uh, they had cellars. They would uh, cut ice from ponds and take it into their cellar, cover it with hay, and they would have, if I recall, they could have cold meat until July if, under the right conditions and they had enough ice. And then if it moves on from there, it got to where, you know, electricity and you, and you had your small locker plants like this start up. By 1940, almost half of U.S. homes had a refrigerator. Eventually, demand for the lockers fell off. Many of the surviving shops diversified by adding butchering services. According to census data, a large decline occurred between 1992 and 2012, when 45% of the remaining U.S. meat shops closed their doors. More than 300 miles to the northeast, in southern Minnesota, is another meat locker that survived the decades when so many others closed. The 81-year-old Conger Meat Market was opened in 1935 by a Czechoslovakian immigrant and butcher named Ray Butch Bohanek. An area farmer had convinced Bohanek to leave the Lake Mills, Iowa butcher shop where he was working to open his own in Conger, Minnesota. Milford Bohanek, who ran the operation with his wife Beverly from 1959 to 2000, says his father built the shop on skids, thinking he could have the building dragged to a new location if Conger let him down. There wasn't a basement put in there until well, I don't know the number of years afterwards, and they lifted the building up and, and put a basement underneath it, yeah. The Bohonic family ran Conger Meat Market 
for 70 years before selling it 11 years ago to current owners, Jeremy and Darcy Johnson. What we originally talked about was to leave everything the same. We didn't want to change anything. We didn't want to change the recipes, the tried and true traditions of the Conger meat market. They worked for 80 years, so that's not something we were going to change. The couple has tried to keep the big things, like Butch Bahonik's traditional recipes from Czechoslovakia, and little things, like handing out samples from the meat smoker to kids, while making plans for future expansion. We thought it's a great opportunity um, to buy an established business and to be self-employed. Currently, the meat sold in their small retail shop comes from larger federally inspected meat packing plants that are scattered throughout the nation. They, like many smaller state inspected meat lockers, are limited to connecting livestock producers with buyers looking for custom cut quarters or halves of beef, pork, or venison. They are also restricted to in-state sales. Our job, in a sense, is easy because we are surrounded by so many successful farmers and the quality of the meat that's coming in is just second to none. And I think uh, people, the customers, are happy when they come through our door because they know they're going to fill their freezer with um, locally raised, good quality beef or pork. Next year, Darcy and Jeremy Johnson hope to open a small, federally inspected meat packing plant in an old creamery next door. Because they will be federally inspected, they will be able to sell locally raised meat in smaller amounts directly to the customers. The designation further allows for sales across state lines. So far, the creamery they are renovating for the Conger meat market expansion does not appear to feature any skids. I think uh, the Conger meat market will be here for another 80 years. For Market to Market, I'm Colleen Bradford Krantz. Next, the Market to Market Report. Tighter world supplies were counterbalanced by good weather conditions and disappointing exports. All served to leave the commodity markets mixed at Friday's close. For the week, September wheat lost 18 cents, while the nearby corn contract remained even. Tighter worldwide supplies helped the September soybean contract battle its way back from last week's 66 cent decline to finish 21 cents higher on Friday. September meal followed suit, adding $4.10 per ton. In the softs, December cotton gained $1.36 per hundredweight. Over in the dairy parlor, August Class Three milk futures advanced 38 cents. The livestock sector had a volatile week as the October cattle contract went 365 higher. September feeders improved 275, and the October lean hog contract carried losses into a sixth week, shedding an additional 485. In the currency markets, the U.S. dollar index dropped a whopping 203 points. Crude oil lost $2.59 per barrel. Gold added $26 per ounce. And the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index lost more than 10 points to finish the week at $3.39.15. Here now to lend us her insight on these and other trends is one of our regular market analysts, Angie Setzer. Angie, welcome back. Hey. We are excited to have you. We've got a lot going on this yeah. week. We've got a lot happening in the commodity markets the ag world as a whole, but I want to start off looking at wheat. Yeah. And as we dig into this wheat market, we got a question from one of our Twitter followers. This is from Jenny in Illinois. She's asking, what are some strategies to deal with the glut of grain at harvest? And that's a situation we are dealing with in wheat country. Oh, yeah. How do you deal with it? Definitely in wheat country. Um, and that's what, one of the biggest things I always tell any growers that I speak to is to look around and see what your local market looks like ahead of um, any sort of new crop coming in, any sort of harvest, anything like that. And I'll also pay attention to what you have for old crop. So the first step, of course, is if you think that you're going to run into a harvest glut, the last thing you want to do is carry any old crop supplies into that harvest glut and, and just make, you know, go from a bad situation to a worst one. Um, so first things first is, is if no one's letting go of that old crop stuff and you're seeing a little bit of some basis strength due to lower futures prices, it never hurts to go ahead and get that sold. Um, you know, and in the past we've talked about 
about it. If you're still bullish the market long term, uh, look at some option strategies or something like that. Um, and if you're looking around and, and you know right now that you're going to go into harvest and, and potentially run out of space um, at the local elevator, then you need to speak for as much space as you possibly can or be prepared for that. So um, when it comes to marketing cash grain, the number one thing you have to look at is your space availability and then function accordingly. Um, of course, that'll be the elevator's responsibility to try to make sure that he or she in charge are able to ship out what they can. Um, but there could be a point in time in some areas where they're, the pipeline is especially full. Um, Kansas, I mean, they've had, had a huge wheat crop a year ago, a huge corn crop and another huge wheat crop. Um, and so if they have another big corn crop, uh, there will be issues with the availability of, of space and, and elevators being able to take that grain. So be prepared to either find alternate storage, uh, be prepared to possibly harvest slowly if you can't, sure. or um, you know, just be aware of what your local situation is and, and make sure that you're speaking for space if you think you're going to need it. And unfortunately, when the price is low, sometimes that means you have to choose, you know, pick your poison. Right. Uh, do you sell grain now and know that you can harvest it and get it out of the field and, and perhaps go um, to the paper side of things on, on the long side? Um, or do you roll the dice? But if you're going to roll the dice, be prepared for what could be some pretty nasty consequences. You don't always win in a dice roll. Exactly. Speaking of not always winning, yeah. are we going to see $3 Chicago wheat? Or three, three handle Chicago three wheat? Three handle Chicago wheat. Um, the buyers seem to say no right now. Um, even this week, we, we tend to try to troll the bottom at least. I wouldn't be surprised if we didn't test it. Okay. Um, I, I, I really wish I could say that we should should rock it back. I, I do think we do. I think we wheat eventually rallies. Um, I think the record fund short in Chicago wheat combined with the issues that we're seeing develop in Europe. Um, you know, a lot of people will tout the Russian crop as being mm -hmm. huge, which it, it does sound like it's large. Um, but Russia and, and China have went to the same school when it comes to, uh, you know, if, if the house is on fire, they'll tell you they like it hot. So you always have to kind of wait and see what actually makes its way into the pipeline out of those two countries. Okay. Um, and I think there's some other issues that will develop on the Chinese side, too, with wheat. Um, you know, we have to remember the China effect, which is, is very skewed. Uh, China's holding on to over 40 percent of the global wheat stocks. So you take China out, um, you know, and, and wheat is not something that's necessarily easy to store. Um, you know, of the Chinese wheat, of that 40 percent of global stocks, I wonder how much has become bug food. Right. Um, you know, and, and maybe they can market it as extra protein, but it's going to be a little difficult for them. So there's some things out there combined with the record short that I'm watching that I, I really think um, when wheat gets its legs underneath it, it's going to blow the doors off and, okay. and probably surprise a lot of people. Um, but it might be short-lived, like our corn rally, mm -hmm. where we, we pop up, um, everyone starts to get extremely bullish, and then we fall back again. Um, it, but it, it could take six months or so. It might okay. take confirmation in January that we have a dramatic drop in plantings, All potentially. Right. Well, now let's talk about this corn market. We yeah. saw that rally completely fade into the rearview mirror today. We're relatively stable yeah. in this corn crop. How do you handle old crop corn in the bin today? Old crop corn in the bin, it depends on where you're at. That's the hard part. There's a huge dichotomy that's developed in um, basis in the Western Belt. Um, you know, and it's very difficult in the Western Belt. It goes back to that being prepared for what could be a harvest glut. Um, you know, I drive around out here in, in Iowa and in parts of Nebraska, Minnesota. Um, it, Minnesota is the, the northern version of Kansas right now because they are already choking on supplies in a lot of ways. Um, and the potential is there for them to have another huge burdensome crop to come back into them. So you have to know in those areas that you're really, the amount of lipstick you're going to be able to put on any pig is probably pretty limited. Um, some of your best basis opportunity is probably going to come in the next two to three weeks. Okay. You know, and, and, and I know it still stinks. It just it, your best basis opportunity doesn't mean that it's the thing that makes you happy. Right. You know, best isn't always good. Yes, exactly. Best does not equate to good sometimes. Um, but if if you're going to be in harvest mode here in another four weeks and you're holding on to old crop grain, expecting the the price mm -hmm. to appreciate, you may be very sad. Okay. So to convert that and and. Uh, um, move in that direction and, and again look at the long on the paper side if you want to if you're bullish um, That's that would be how I would approach it. The Eastern Belt's a little different. Yeah, right now with my guys um, We're able to trade 20 25 30 over into some areas okay. the Toledo markets gotten especially hot due to corn export pace picking up 
Um, so we've been doing basis contracts at this point in time. We're going to see what happens over the next couple weeks Okay. Um, with the thought process that we'll probably price and then watch, um, you know, at Before some point. Before any but, kind of a re But yeah, strategy. a 20 over basis on a 330, it still gets you 350. It's not anything you're going to write better home about. Better than 290. But it's much better, yes. Yeah. So the Eastern Belt guys are selling. The Western okay. Belt guys, I recommend you, you look to, to sell into it. And um, Okay. Well, well now, you talked about the strengthening corn exports. On Thursday, we mm -hmm. saw some of those old crop bean sales mm -hmm. roll into new crop. Yeah. We saw a negative old crop number for the first time in a year, I think, it's roughly. Yeah. So we're finding strength in this new crop bean market. Yeah. Is that enough? Do we have enough strength here? to really get a pop in the market. It's gonna depend on what our weather does, unfortunately. So you tell me what weather will be like August 15th and we'll let you know. Supposedly, it's gonna be hot across the entire and country, that's the according thing. to So Noah. Yeah, and, and you can tell when you're in a, bar, a bearish market because th th two months ago, if we would have seen the forecast that we had right now and all of the rain in the Eastern Belt and 95 degree temperatures and, and very little rain forecast, when it's 95 degrees, a tenth of an inch of rain doesn't do you too too much good. Mm -hmm. um, but we're in a, a bearish setup right now. So you see a, a QPF weather map come out and all of a sudden we have more than adequate rains for the Corn Belt and the guys in Nebraska are scratching their head wondering where those rains are. Um, you know, So it, it's going to be very difficult to convince the market that we need a different narrative for one. We're turning the Titanic on that side. Um, but I do think the potential is there. Um, being are one of those crops that to get two bushel higher than trend is a lot harder than it is in, in corn. Um, you know, so you have a lot of people that, oh, if we have 48 bushel beans, okay, yeah, and, and if I go home and have a unicorn in my front yard, I'm going to be pretty happy too. So it's one of those things that we really have to watch what happens because um, I, I think to me the support is there in the bean market until we can confirm 48 okay. um, bushel uh, because right now we know our carryout is reasonably... Um, it's good. 290 is an okay carryout. Now, the million dollar question, of course, is what happens in South America. Um, so to me, I think we keep a risk premium in place, A, until we're able to harvest the beans um, and, and know what we have production-wise and fill that pipeline. Because there's going to be a front-end short on, on the bean side of things due okay. to the, the big export book we have. That's right. And so everyone wanted to focus on those cancellations quickly. We had two days in a row this week of old crop sales announced. Yes. Of, of mo well more than what was canceled. We had 1,400, bush, uh, 1400 t metric ton canceled, and we've sold about 120,000 and metric yeah. ton in the last two demand days. Demand is there. So the demand is there. Yeah. Um, we just got to figure out when we're going to ship them. And everyone, September is in, in the new crop marketing year, but you're still shipping old crop beans. Yes. Well, now let's quickly talk through this livestock market. Yeah. We saw, finally, some life in this live cattle market. Yeah. Almost a $4 bounce limit up on Monday. Wow. Ooh. Where do we go from here? Um, I think you are going to see some resistance. The same reasons we talked about the last time I was on. I think feeder cattle supplies are decent. I think live cattle supplies are decent. I mean, we're not in any concern on, on the supply side. Um, I, I wonder what will happen from a global standpoint. You know, we've had a lot of competition with what's going on in, in Brazil. Um, I, Someone with a much higher pay grade than me is going to have to talk about what their shortage of feed grains will do for their cattle supply as we go forward. I'll let someone way smarter okay. um, handle that. But um, the one thing we are going to see is we are going to start to feed back to higher weights, I think. And so, you know, it's going to take less cattle to produce the same amount of meat. So that's going to be an issue there. And we have there. more cattle in the yards today. Exactly. Um, okay. We did see, though, that more heifers have made it into the lot. So we are not, we're not growing herds anymore. So I think that's good for your feeder market a year from now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but that doesn't help you sleep at night right now. So on this bump, on this rally here mm -hmm. this week, we'll call it a rally. $4, we'll call that a rally Four in the live rally, cattle market. Yeah. Are we selling it or do you or do you wait and let it ride? It goes back to the same thing we've always talked about. You cannot put cattle in a bin. You can't, I mean, really when it comes down to it, so if, if you have um, if you have a need to, to sell, pocket it and move on, okay. um, you're going to see a continuation of volatility. I'd like to think that this is just a start of, of a turn. Um, you know, I, I keep, it's the same thing I keep watching in the wheat market, the corn mm -hmm. market, the hog market. Um, you know you're, you're, you've trolled bottom for a while and you know that all it's going to take is a matter of buyers coming back into the system, but what narrative is that that kicks those buyers in? All right. Now, you mentioned feeder cattle not looking at a whole lot of bright side we got more feeders today you mentioned hogs trolling the bottom yeah. we've seen this hog market 
I don't want to say collapse, but I mean, it's dropped almost $35 here in say, six weeks. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to be diplomatic here. Yeah, that's... So are we at a bottom here at 59 and change? I'm never going to pick a bottom. Okay. That's a, that's always a fun thing. That's the best way to have someone throw it at you in another two weeks when we're yeah. another down another big chunk. Yeah. But I would say we're close to it, in okay. my opinion. Um, this is one of those dinner table conversations my husband and I have where he thinks I'm wrong, and I think he is. So we'll we'll agree to disagree on that one, market. right? Um, but I think that there we have to see what happened to the, the Chinese issue. Now they're saying they're not going to come out and buy any U.S. pork. Um, for quite some time, yada, yada, yada. Um, but hungry people dictate more than than uh, what a government wants to say. And of course, you know, you're know you not going to tell everyone that you're going to come in and buy a huge amount of pork. You're going to buy first and then let everyone know later that you did. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that there's potential there to kind of see a pop because of that. Um, you know, in, in my opinion, if you look at a, a hog chart, I think your August hogs are at five-year lows. Um, so, of course, that doesn't mean that they can't extend one more leg, um, but I think that your, your selling is going to become exhausted, that trade's going to become old, and someone out there is going to look at that chart and think, wow, hogs are at a five-year low. Why aren't we buying? Um, and then maybe the China story gets some traction and, and we're back. But it's going to be just like anything else, just because we are... Just because I'm optimistic on price doesn't mean I'm necessarily, necessarily bullish long term compared okay. to where your five year average has been running. Would you be buying some calls out in the deferred months at this point? If you know you're going to, you know, with as cheap as where we're at, if, if you have to make some sales and, and want to protect yourself to some upside, yeah. Okay. All right. Well, Angie Setzer, we have a lot of questions for you to answer in our Market Plus segment, but thanks for joining us on the thanks show. Thanks for having me. That wraps up the broadcast portion of Market to Market. But as I mentioned, Angie and I will keep the market conversation going, including answering more of your questions during Market Plus, which is available on our website. While you're there, check out the Market to Market Classroom. It's a place where students of all ages can find stories on the business, technology, and science of agriculture. And join us again next week when we'll examine how legal cannabis is changing the economy in Colorado's capital. So until then, thanks for watching. I'm Mike Pearson. Have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa Public Television, which is solely responsible for its content. Funding for Market to Market is provided by Grinnell Mutual. You think differently about a customer when you stand in the middle of his dreams. We work to make sure you get covered right. Grinnell Mutual, a policy of working together. Information on finding an agent near you is available at GrinnellMutual.com.